Hello, data makers. I'm really excited to be here. A while ago, I got really excited about the topic of synthetic data. And I believe it's a huge enabler and even a door opener to such a thing as artificial general intelligence. So in the rest of my talk, um, I'm going to explore with you the benefits of synthetic data and the ways how you can utilize it for your robotics and perceptions applications. And in this video, um, I'm showing you different robots. Robots are awesome, and robots come in different shapes and functions. They can be small in size, they can be large, uh, they can have a different, uh, well, form factor, uh, and uh, of course, different applications. So there are delivery robots, uh, there are caregiver robots, there are robots performing surgeries and robots flying to space. Uh, robots doing agricultural tasks, uh, robots sorting garbage, and uh, in short, they are huge help helpers to humankind, and they make our lives better. However, sometimes robots fail, and imagine uh, you have a robot uh, which is designed to rescue, so you're expecting this robot to come and save the world, but then things like that happen. Or you have a robot, and you want it to serve you a freshly brewed cup of coffee, but then things like that happen. Oh. Another one is my favorite, a ketchup-serving robot. What could possibly go wrong, right? And this one especially is painful for me, because it happened with my own vacuum cleaning robot. And the reason why things like that happen is because these robots, they have been automated instead of being fully autonomous. And by being automated, we mean that there is a developer behind who sat there and wrote a list of comments line by line, uh, giving comments like, go straight, turn to the right. And in order to be, a, like, for a robot, in order to be fully autonomous, we need to rely on AI. A robot needs to be able to act and react in the environment and make decisions on its own. And for that, we need AI. But AI robots have many needs. And the first need uh, is data. Data is fuel of digital world, and uh, there is no AI possible without data. Robots also need training, lots of training. And by training, we understand hardware infrastructure, uh, the algorithms to train your robots, and the neural, no neural network architectures. And robots also need testing. Uh, you need to make sure that your AI robot is able to generalize on unseen environments. So testing is an essential part of developing an AI robot. And uh, in my talk, of course, I will focus on data today. And uh, the first thoughts when, which come to mind when developing an AI robot is, why don't they go outside and collect some real data? But real data is not free of some limitations. So let's quickly go through these limitations. The first limitation of real data is, first of all, it's really hard to label. And for perception systems, we still hugely rely on annotated data and supervised learning, and we need annotators. And annotating data can be hard. Think of, think of applications like um, semantic segmentation, where you need to segment uh, small objects sometimes. Sometimes the scenes can be really crowded and hard to segment, and your hands can be really shaking. And uh, those of you who have ever gone through this exercise, you know how tedious it is. And when we think, when we add an extra dimension like 3D, uh, lighter point clouds, it gets even harder, even impossible, I would say. Um, this these are some images from our autonomous vehicle data set, uh, which we use to train our autonomous driving uh, vehicles at NVIDIA. And some of these examples show that it can be also hard on different levels. So data can be blurry or hazy. You can oversee some objects. Uh, some objects can be occluded, like a pedestrian or a bicycle crossing the street. Uh, some things can be also very irregular and hard to annotate. And other scenes can be also crowded by objects. So think of the busy uh, pedestrian crossing in Shibuya in Tokyo and try to 
like draw bounding boxes around every pedestrian there. So it's very crowded, it's very tedious. Uh, real data is also hard to collect. And the first example of uh, such hard data to collect are the long tail anomalies. Uh, by long tail anomalies, we understand uh, the cases when um, some event is happening not that often, and uh, its occurrence in, like, its natural occurrence in the real world is really hard and unpredictable. Uh, one example of such a situation could be you're an autonomous driving car, and you're arriving at the crossroad, and the light is green, so theoretically, you're fine to move forward. However, an emergency vehicle is coming on the right, and you need to give it uh, the, the right to pass. So that's an example of a long tail anomaly. Also, talking about data which is hard to label, again, I've mentioned already LiDAR scans, so there are some non-visual sensors like radars and LiDARs, and this data is really hard to label. And finally, there are also some indirect features like speed or direction, which are not obvious for a human observer and human labeler. Uh, real data has also large amortization cost. And uh, when you're talking about desi designing a robot uh, which will move uh, and uh, act in a factory setting, uh, we also need to deal with assembly lines being reconfigured quite frequently. Or navigation routes in warehouses can be changed as well. And when we think about uh, perception applications for retail, uh, like a robot picker, for example, um, you know that uh, uh, packages are also changing uh, quite frequently. Think of football games or Christmas campaigns. The packages need to be adjusted accordingly. And retraining your models and recollecting the data can be quite painful here. And I believe that we can rely on synthetic data to solve these challenges and to bridge these gaps of real data. So let's, let's look further uh, how we can use synthetic data. And, but first of all, what is actually synthetic data? And I brought this, uh, this definition here. Synthetic data is annotated information that computer simulations or algorithms generate as an alternative to real-world data. In short, it's fake data. So it doesn't come from real world, it comes from some uh, virtual simulation. You start with something like a digital twin, uh, or, well, digital, be it the digital twin of your object or the whole environment, and then you generate uh, this render of this uh, virtual object together with some annotations, and then you use it to train your neural networks. So synthetic data comes with many benefits. Let me quickly go through them. Uh, one such benefit is that it helps you to solve the situations where uh, humans can't label. So they may, uh, synthetic data makes ground truth available, uh, which is hard to get with just human labeling. And here can be examples like occlusion, adverse weather condition. Think of a pedestrian crossing the street on a rainy day at night. Um, it can also incorporate the indirect uh, features like velocity, or it can also provide you with 3D bounding boxes if we are talking about uh, point clouds, for example. Uh, synthetic data allows you full programmability, which means that you, as a creator of a synthetic data set, have the full control of your data set. And uh, one such example is that uh, those of you who have ever worked with autonomous driving, you know Kitty data set. It's a popular benchmark for autonomous driving. And you may know that it's very unbalanced when it comes to cyclists. It doesn't have enough cyclists in the data set. With synthetic data, this problem could have been easily solved by adding it as a parameter, for example. Uh, speed is also an important benefit of synthetic data. With synthetic data, you can start developing ad hoc, and uh, you don't need to rely on collecting the data. Of course, it's, there is a learning curve. You need to set up your virtual environment but then you can modify it and regenerate it as many times as possible. Uh, that comes with also some cost savings, because you don't need to invest time and money into collecting and labeling the data. It gets uh, cheaper for you. And finally, synthetic data is also more accurate, because when you don't rely on the human in the loop, uh, humans are usually making mistakes, but synthetic data provides you with pixel-accurate labels. 
And uh, synthetic data also helps you with corner cases. Think about this ambulance ca coming on the red light. Uh, so you can address long tail anomalies and you can cover the known unknowns. And finally, synthetic data also comes with no data restrictions. Um, you may know that working with public database, uh, there are always some uh, limitations of these data sets in terms of can I use it for my commercial application or not? Uh, you also need to anonymize, like you need to blur faces or license plates. With synthetic data, you're free of that. And by the way, some of the images in my presentation I've also synthetically generated just for the same reasons, including this one. Um, how does deep learning with synthetic data work? Um, first of all, let's look at the typical deep learning pipeline with real data. The process is straightforward. You go outside, you collect the data, you label it uh, for the objects of interest, and then you convert it to the format is, which is acceptable by a deep neural network. Sometimes you need to downsize your image, sometimes you need to crop it. Then you run the training and you evaluate your model. And based on this evaluation, you decide, do I need to tune my hyperparameters or do I need to go outside again and collect more data? With synthetic data, it's a little bit different. Synthetic data, you first need to understand what kind of content I'm trying to simulate there. Then you apply a set of transformations. Well, you bring this content to the digital world, and then you apply a set of randomizers to this content, and then you apply rendering to this, uh, to, to this uh, the virtual scene, and you generate data plus annotation masks together with this data. And then you get your synthetic data set, which you use to train in your neural network. Uh, upon evaluation, you can do another thing with synthetic data. You can actually use it as a feedback loop. The results of your evaluation, you can use it as a feedback to your synthetic, uh, well, to your synthetic generator. Meaning that uh, you can automate the process and you can uh, make your data perfect based on the evaluation metrics. Uh, one thing you need to consider uh, when starting training with synthetic data is the so-called seem to real domain gap. And you can think of it as a difference between two domains. It also applies to real data. When you, for example, train an autonomous vehicle uh, in the countryside, you cannot use this model if this autonomous vehicle is going to drive in the uh, urban environment like New York, for example. So you need to consider all kinds of data when you train your network. And uh, applied to AI and synthetic data, uh, we have two, two kinds of sim to real gaps. The first one is appearance gap, which is a pixel level differences to the real sensor output. This can be different in object shape, but also in textures and uh, basically how the objects look. Can be also a difference in the capabilities of the rendering system. And we also have content gap. In content gap, we understand uh, as differences in diversity, context, and behavior to real data. Do I have one object on the scene or five objects in, in the scene? Uh, context really matters. So let me actually demonstrate why context matters. So imagine you walk outside and you see a tiger, but then you walk closer and you understand that, nope, it wasn't a tiger. And I really don't need to explain the next one, so context really matters. Uh, in order to bridge this seem to real domain gap, uh, we need to rely on the technique which is called domain randomization, uh, which is basically, um, which means that transforming your appearance of your assets uh, by randomizing some certain aspects of this uh, appearance, be it some morphological characteristics like color, lighting, textures, but also some geometrical properties like scaling, rotation, and we can also simulate movement of uh, this object. And there are different ways to utilize the main randomization. The first one is uh, the so-called realistic, where you use a digital twin and uh, you vary some properties like textures, lighting, but you do it in the natural way. Uh, you can do it also in the semi-realistic manner where you still use real objects, but you add some funky textures and colors. And here in this image, you see that uh, it still lo looks like a room. Maybe a crazy person lives there, but it's still a room. 
The third way is the so-called unrealistic or highly diverse uh, domain randomization. Here, it's very useful when you, for example, train an object detector. Here you can create uh, all kinds of objects, including the object of interest. And the reason why it works is basically by doing that, you encapsulate the real world conditions in the high variety of your synthetic data set. And you might wonder now, which one is actually the most useful for me, for my use case? And I usually say, it's the matter of experimentation. Um, one or another can work depending on your use case. Uh, that's an interesting paper I found online, and it's, uh, the, the authors of this paper, they, uh, they, have, they were able to show that uh, convolutional neural networks are biased towards texture, whereas we as humans, we are biased towards shape. And in this research, they, they were trying different things, and uh, once they fed this image of uh, the elephant texture in the network, uh, the network was able, with high confidence, it was able to predict that there is an Indian elephant in this image. Um, the second image, the image of the cat, it uh, still was able to predict that there is a cat in the image. However, with a bit of a lower, uh, with a lower probability score. And then when they did this experiment where they overimposed this image of the cat or the texture of the elephant, it was still predicting that there is an elephant. And by using the main randomization, you could potentially solve this problem when you would vary, for example, different textures of the cat, giving it different colors. Uh, you could assure that you are resolving this uh, texture bias. Another uh, very, useful, uh, very useful application of domain randomization is, uh, if you remember in the beginning, I've mentioned that AI robots need lots of testing. And you can actually use synthetic data and domain randomization also to test your robots and to see how they behave in different environments and in different setups by synthetically generating the scenes. And you may wonder how we actually bring the virtual assets, well, how we bring real objects into the virtual worlds. And there are different ways to capture uh, reality. And the first one is uh, and the most straightforward one is to rely on the artist-driven manual workflow. So you hire some good 3D designer who creates your objects in programs like Blender, and then you use some popular environments to create the digital twins of this object uh, in a combination with other objects sometimes. Um, another way uh, is uh, to reconstruct three objects is to rely on the traditional photogrammetry. A technique like structure promotion can be used, for example, where you take your camera and you take multiple photos of an object from a different uh, perspectives, and then you apply the technique which is called triangulation to recover the 3D geometry of this object. Uh, you can also rely on some depth sensors like lasers or radars or things like Kinect device. And then you, you can have a point cloud which you can meshify using techniques like Martian cubes, for example. Uh, another cool technique uh, which has been recently introduced uh, is called NERF, uh, or Neural Radiance Fields. And uh, it works conceptually in a similar way that a structure from motion where you take multiple images of your object from different perspectives. Uh, but instead of relying on mathematical techniques like triangulation, you apply deep learning and you learn different uh, geometry structures from the sequence of images. And in the beginning, uh, NERF was quite slow. But uh, my colleagues from research, they, last year, they have introduced uh, the technique called Instant NGP, which is, by the way, open source and is available on GitHub. And uh, with this Instant NGP, you can achieve rendering uh, in 30 frames per second, uh, which is already very close to real time. And according to, time, uh, to times, uh, this became one of uh, the best inventions uh, of the last year. So. Uh, my colleagues are really proud about that. Um, of course, NERF uh, has some caveats, and uh, to reconstruct the NERF, uh, we've observed that it's usually faster if you have some uh, rigid structures with many sharp edges. Uh, well, for VSP objects, it's a, it's a little bit, it takes a little bit more time because we need this time to incorporate color. Also, it doesn't work really well with uh, transparent objects and reflective objects.
And there is another technique uh, which you can use to create synthetic data, and uh, it's called domain adaptation, and it relies on generative AI. Uh, you can use it to apply you know, synthesis, style transfer, GANs. GANs were used until recently, but now we are more into this diffusion era where we use approaches like DALI, stable diffusion, edify. And um, in this slide, I'm showing you an experiment I ran a while ago. So I draw this image of which was supposed to be a pink panther. And please don't judge my drawing skills. I draw it <laughs> on my computer. <laughs> and I was using stable diffusion in order to make it look like a pink panther. So I, and that, that's the image I got, which I was like, wow, that's impressive. But then I thought, hmm, maybe it's a cat. And I've asked it to generate me a cat, and it gave me a cat. But then I took another look and said, no, maybe it's a bear. And it gave me a bear. But then I went nuts and I generated a monkey and a cow and even a pig. So you can imagine I had lots of fun doing this exercise. To finish my today's talk, I'd like to demonstrate to you the Edify, uh, the network uh, developed by my colleagues. And uh, it's able also to generate some images from textual prompts. But not, not only images, but also videos and 3D objects, uh, which can be then exported by the API. And uh, you can import these objects to some popular editing applications like Photoshop, for example, or you can take these shapes and uh, incorporate them in the virtual world building platforms like Omniverse, like I'm showing you here. So these are 3D assets brought together in the digital twin of this ancient city. And then you can render really nice scenes. So the possibilities are really limitless, and I'm excited to see what comes next. Thank you for this. It was very insightful. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of buzz here in the audience because I think synthetic data will be the next trend for the next few years. Uh, one question that came up was, what do you think about using large multimodal models, multimodal models mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, like GPT-4 uh, to create this type of synthetic data? So the last three slides of my presentation were about using multimodal models, and generative AI like diffusion and uh, stable diffusion, edify. These are large multimodal models. Uh, they don't rely on GPT-4, but uh, in the background, uh, at least like models like uh, stable diffusion, they rely on a network called Clip, uh, which is essentially a network which brings together images and text and allows this text-guided generation. So definitely there is a huge, uh, there are many opportunities to using this uh, technology for synthetic data. Okay. But traditionally, these models also drink a lot from data, right? So they must have um, certain, I would say, blind spots to realistic data. Um, and one concern with synthetic data often comes down to how how do you verify really that your mm -hmm. data is realistic? Can we really use it? Does it really map out uh, the, mm -hmm. the real world behavior? How, how does that, it get that's, addressed? That's a very important question. And always um, I recommend uh, using uh, real data to test your synthetic, uh, synthetically trained models. And in my practice, I've done many experiments with synthetic data and uh, it's, it's always necessary to use real data in order to see that your model can generalize well. And that's why sometimes we need several iter iterations to make a synthetic data work for your real data. Yeah, okay. So imagine that you are training a model um, and you do it with uh, a standard uh, data set or prior learning. Uh, but now you want to map out something that has random noise in it. So mm -hmm. how do you um, really uh, account for those long tails or mm -hmm. rare events on your data? So one of the techniques, uh, as I showed you, was to incorporate more than we can think of. It's where you introduce all this random noise and funky textures and colors just to make sure that your solution uh, lies somewhere within the domain of uh, this uh, knowledge of this model. So you try to incorporate more 
than it's probably even in the real world. Of course, it's a challenge, and sometimes, as I've also mentioned in my slides, you need to cover the known unknowns, because if you cannot potentially even imagine a situation happening, that uh, it's really hard to design it. Yes, I think one of the main bottlenecks in robotics right now is that we don't have enough data, uh, enough images. We would yeah. think that the most brainy activities would be uh, harder to map with AI, but it's the, the contrary. So sometimes they call it the, the revenge of the <laughs> operational type of works. Yeah. Um, maybe we can think about, okay, this is all truly fantastic, but is there like a dark side of using synthetic data? Is there an advantage, uh, mm. sorry, a disadvantage in using it? Or what could mm. that be? Sometimes it's really hard. And um, I was working once on an application for PCB inspection, and we thought, okay, we'll design this PCB boards and uh, which looked like real data. And then it took us like five iterations of like training and then improving the data set. So until you get there, you need to go and do some work. And in this task, I was working together with a 3D designer, and it also was, it costed some work of the designer, of course, but it's also a learning curve to become a good designer, right? So it's a, it's a different way of working that, uh, of working with data, I would say. Okay, and to finalize, I think um, some people are curious about how to use or what could be the best methods for uh, more structured, tabular type of data, and mm. even if NVIDIA is actually using GANs, uh, generative field personal networks. Yeah, like text and structured data is a different sort of data, I would say. Yeah, sure. And uh, what I observe in that domain now that uh, we more and more rely on unsupervised learning. And for example, for perception systems, it's really hard still to rely on fully unsupervised learning. That's why uh, we need something like synthetic data. In the domain of uh, language and uh, tabular data, I think that we still need to, like probably we, would, we need to rely more on algorithms and data processing and extracting the data in the unsupervised fashion.